by continuing to be in the meeting, I am consenting to be recorded. Okay. You okay with that? <laughs> That's fine, I guess. <laughs> All right, Darren, let's dive in. Welcome to the Visionary Life Podcast. We are so excited to sit down with you today and have had a chance to interview many of your fellow colleagues and entrepreneur friends in the town of Bracebridge. So it's a pleasure to be able to sit down with you. And today we're going to crack into the story of how Lake of Bays Brewery came to be. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So let's kick off with some rapid fire here. So where did you grow up and where do you live now? I grew up in Mississauga. Um, my, uh, both my parents are actually from the UK. So, uh, so my sister and I are kind of first, first generation Canadians. Um, and uh, most of our family still actually lives over there. Um, so yeah, grew up in Mississauga, went to school in Montreal, um, lived in Baysville for a period of time when the brewery was first getting going. And then now uh, I live in Bracebridge with, uh, with my wife and our two kids. Mm, amazing. And the brewery, it actually started as an idea in your university apartment, right? So can you actually take us back to that time? Like, were you gunning to be an entrepreneur? Did you just love beer so much that you wanted to have a career in it? Like what was going through your mind and how did things come to be back then? What was going through my mind? <laughs> <laughs> Drinking. Um, no, I, I, well, it, it was a combination of the two, really. I mean, I, I would say I, I went off to university uh, thinking that I wanted to start my own business, but not knowing exactly what field I wanted to get into. And then it was while I was at school uh, in Montreal uh, doing a degree in economics that this idea started to creep up on me that I might want to get into the beer business. Um, obviously, a, a you know pretty active uh, brew pub and microbrewery scene in, in Quebec uh, and in Montreal. So I was, uh, you know, I was going to my fair share of breweries. Uh, and, um, and yeah, it, I, I guess the, the, the idea of uh, getting into a, a business where you had kind of a physical product at the end of the day that you could point to appeal to me. Um, and, you know, so much manufacturing has kind of gone elsewhere um, in, in this country. And uh, it was really interesting to see that here was a, a, a kind of a, a manufacturing type of business, admittedly kind of an artisanal manufacturing type business that, that, uh, that seemed to be going in the opposite direction, that it was, a, you know, it was a, an industry that was, that was growing and, and kind of by definition couldn't be outsourced or sent overseas because local is, is part of the inherent nature of craft beer. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I guess the idea kind of started to creep up on me. And then the, the, the joke in the family was it was Christmas, 2007. Um, we, we'd had a family cottage, uh, just south of Baysville, uh, since I was a little kid. Um, and, uh, so knew the area. Well, um, there was a, a property in Baysville that is now the brewery that, uh, that had come on the market. My parents had, had uh, bought it thinking they were just going to lease it to somebody else because uh, it was in a good location in town. And so uh, my, my dad and I are having a beer Christmas 2007 and uh, he's going, oh, I just bought this commercial property. I don't exactly know what I want to do with it. And I'm going, I want to open a brewery. I don't know where to put it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we had, a, we had a couple more beers and then the light bulb kind of slowly flickered on that, uh, oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that could work. So uh, um, yeah, I guess um, I spent some time working uh, at uh, another brewery down in St. Catharines. Um, mm -hmm when I was just starting to put the, the business plan together for Lake of Bays Brewing, uh, went back to school to finish my last year of my economics degree and, and started uh, brewing in my kitchen uh, in my university apartment. Uh, I made friends with the brewmaster at the brew pub that was literally right across the road from, from where I lived. So he, uh, he gave me all sorts of pointers on, uh, on being a better brewer. Um, and then, uh, yeah, moved from, uh, moved from Montreal directly to Baysville in, uh, in 2009 and, uh, and got right into it. So, wow. Uh, I love that. Brewery. What a like yeah. serendipitous moment too, of you being like, I want to start my own brewery. And then your dad having that space where like, he didn't know it was going to be you to fill it. Right. And then in that conversation, mm -hmm. I almost imagine the light bulb moment going off like, Oh, this could be a real thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just very, very cool to reflect on that. And at the time, like, had you decided that you wanted it to be in Baysville or did you go there just because that's where your dad had the space? Um, so I wasn't fully decided on a location at that point, but, but I mean, the more I thought about it, the more, um, you know, the idea of, of putting a brewery in the Lake of Bays area or in Muskoka more generally kind of seemed to make sense. Um, you know, at, at the time, and it sounds funny now, but you know, at the time there were about 45 breweries 
in the province. Mm -hmm. um, there's over 400. Um, but uh, <laughs> you're an early um, adopter. <laughs> Yeah, which is funny because we've only been around for about 11 years and we're, you know, one of the granddaddies in this industry. So, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, so I, I guess it, it felt like an opportunity to, uh, to differentiate essentially that, that, you know, rather than locating in, in an urban center where there were a lot more breweries, felt like it might be harder to stand out. Uh, you know, the thinking was, well, if you, if you locate up here, you've got uh, obviously a, a large number of people who come from all around the province. Uh, to this area every year uh, and that it could be an opportunity to build a, a really great loyal local fan base you know some of whom would then kind of disperse themselves back across the province and and hopefully if they liked our beer they would uh, you know they would bring that with them um, ah. and, and seek it out where, where they lived as well mm -hmm. um, i almost see that as like a really clever marketing strategy to situate yourself where you know there's a lot of people who come for a seasonal visit to their cottage and then you know that they're going to head home to a totally different place at the end of the season and probably bring your beers back so it's just kind of fun to think about like the multiplier effect that happens when you're in a, a place where there are a lot of people who are just there for a few months or maybe even just a few weeks and then they have an alternative home so they'll be going to their local beer stores saying, hey, I really want that beer that I used to get up in Baysville at my cottage. So it's actually very strategic yeah, yeah, in my well, opinion. That, that, that's, the, that's the theory, at least. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's the theory. Think, Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think it is true in many instances. I mean, you know, and there may be other cases where, where people, you know, buy us when, you know, we're kind of their cottage beer. They buy our beer when they're up here. But then, you know, especially given the, the number of breweries in the province now, you know, they we, we suspect that, you know, a lot of people may kind of have their their beer when I'm at home and, and the beer that I drink when I'm here and the beer that I drink when I'm there. But, but you, you know, you hope you're kind of in their, their stable of brands at least where, you know, even if they're not at the cottage, they're, you know, they would still be open to, you know, open to picking your beer up every so often, even when they're back at home. Uh, so, uh, you know, where, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. But, uh, you know, being up here in terms of being able to just advertise and, and kind of build your brand in a really focused way within a relatively small market, uh, certainly a lot more controllable and, and, and a lot more cost effective than, than trying to do a lot of mass advertising in, in larger centers. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it always starts with like a core group of loyal customers and it like mm -hmm. you have to please them first, the first hundred, the first thousand. And that's when mm -hmm. the word of mouth and the referral effect really starts to happen. So it's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, you are you're not uh, my cottage beer necessarily, but you're uh, every time my husband and I go up north, we do a big bike ride around Lake of Bays and Lake of Bays mm -hmm. Brewing is at the halfway point. So I have so many fond memories. We go in there, we enjoy a beer, cool down a little bit, and then we have another 50 K mm -hmm. to do after that. So every time I sip on one of your guys' beers, I'm always thinking about our annual tour of the lake, which is exhausting, but it's so fun that we get to stop there halfway. So lots of good memories mm -hmm. associated with it. <laughs> awesome. Um, so curious, did you have any idea? Cause you said you were something like the 40th or 45th craft brewery or microbrewery in Ontario, right? Something around there. Yeah. Something I mean, around there. Yeah. Did you foresee how big the craft beer industry was about to get? Because like I said, you're kind of an early adopter of it. So I'm curious, like, did you have that entrepreneur brain where you see a trend and you're like, I'm jumping on this? Or did you not really think about that and more get into this out of passion? I, I would say it was, again, a mix of the two. Uh, you know, I'm definitely passionate about beer and, and it was a, a love for beer that that got me into doing this in the first place. Um, I definitely think I recognized as well that that um, craft beer was a was a growing trend. Um, I think, you know, yeah, many people expected there to be some pretty significant growth in, in craft beer. Um, you know, over over the course of the past several years, I, I think what what people, what most people probably didn't anticipate was just the sheer, the growth in the sheer number of breweries, um, where it's actually that growth rate has outstripped the growth rate of the marketplace um, for quite a number of years now. Um, so it, it creates an interesting dynamic where, where while the, the industry is growing, 
while you know consumers might love that there's just this apparent you know infinite <laughs> assortment of, of of interesting beers to try as an individual operator within the space it is actually getting harder and harder um, to grow your business uh, just because there are so many other people out there trying to do the exact same thing as you are um, so you know and it's being it's been challenging enough having gotten into the industry where you know when we did you know, I, I often wish that we'd gotten started about five years sooner, but that wouldn't <laughs> be possible because I was still 18. <laughs> so, um, but, um, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's challenges to it right mm -hmm. now. And, and everybody is having to figure out um, what they are going to do to, to address it. And, you know, you think things that, um, you know, things that worked even two or three years ago, you know, don't necessarily cut it anymore in terms of, you know, beer styles, marketing practices, even just over, the overall business strategy. Um, you know, the days of, of being able to, I think the days of being able to, you know, start a brewery up and, and subsist entirely on uh, sales through what we would call wholesale channels, you know, LCBL beer store, grocery stores, bars and restaurants. I think those days are pretty much done. Uh, it's an important part of many breweries business, but trying to run your business just off of that, unless you had already built a, a lot of scale uh, in this space before uh, the real tidal wave of competition hit, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, unless you have very, very deep pockets to, to uh, you know, really do a, 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 a large amount of marketing activity, yeah, um, you've got to figure out other pieces of the mix uh, that are going to round out your business. Does that mean direct to consumer? Like, are you trying to speak directly to the buyer now? Like someone like me, you're trying to reach me through Instagram mm -hmm. or email and get me to purchase directly from your brewery? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's part of it. I mean, we, we launched an online store just over a year ago at the beginning mm -hmm. of the pandemic, which is actually, yeah, we'd be pretty pleased with. Awesome. Um, obviously we're, we're in the brew business now as well. We've got the location in Huntsville and the, and the one in Bracebridge. Um, we, uh, we're opening a, a beer garden actually that's, uh, that live outside in Bracebridge, uh, cool. this summer as well. We're just putting the finishing touches on that, um, which is, which is going to be really exciting. And then we've got the, the location in Batesville as well, where we've been, uh, um, operating a retail store in, a, in kind of a smaller beer garden since, uh, since we opened essentially, but, uh, we are kind of looking at ways of stepping that up now as well. We've got a small food component there. Um, we've increased our seating on the patio. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, it, it's, uh, and, and, and different breweries are doing different things. You know, some are, some are getting into other types of beverages, like getting into cannabis or, um, uh, or into seltzers or, or, or TV or, you know, like that, um, uh, coolers and things like that. Or, um, you know, we've, uh, we've gotten into doing even just some contract production as well. So we make, we make beer for other breweries now. Uh, kind of white labeling it essentially uh, breweries that might lack capacity to make all of their, their own beer for themselves but so I, I think everybody is having to look around and, and figure out one or two other things that they're going to do in addition to <laughs> selling beer kind of through the established channels in order to in order to make things kind of work in an overall sense so mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I think to a certain degree, like as business owners, that's like what we sign up for is always needing to identify opportunities because you're always trying mm -hmm. to diversify and mitigate risk. And I think that's exactly what you're doing by being aware that it's no longer okay to just rely on this one channel of distribution, but there are m many more opportunities, right? It's like, where are mm -hmm. people drinking beer right now? Where are they buying their beer? Where do they want to be reached by a company like Lake of Bays? And then making sure that you have a presence there, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think it's just shifting spending patterns and it's almost like you have to act as a psychologist. It's like, where are people wanting to be talked to or reached with a marketing message? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, and then there's that perennial question of, of how much diversification is too, too much diversification, you know, like you, yeah. need, you need, you need some, some breadth, but, but that can be taken too far as well. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's not any one right answer to that question. I think you gotta, you gotta figure out, figure it out for your own organization as to what's going to work. Yeah. You have so, to kind of be like a scientist and keep experimenting. And I'm sure some yeah, experiments yeah, and, fail. <laughs> yeah. And then hopefully not blow anything up too badly. Right? So. <laughs> 
Um, being that obviously the market, like, I don't like the word saturated, but we'll call it quote unquote craft beer. It's a, a busy place. Um, I'm curious Mm. what makes Lake of Bay's beer and what makes your brewery different when compared to all of the other 399 options across Ontario? Like, do you know what it is that makes you guys really stand out? Well, I mean, that, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I think, you know, the, the fair answer to it is that, you know, there are lots of breweries in Ontario that, that make good beer and yes. that market it as a good beer and yeah. do a good job serving their customers and things like that, you know? So, so you know, I could, I could list off a whole bunch of characteristics that I think, you know, are things that I think we're good at, but that's not to say that nobody else is, is also good at those things, you know? And, and I think, I think legitimate differentiation is, is, a real, real challenge within mm-hmm. the craft beer space right now. I think that not like clearly not everybody is doing it, is doing craft beer well, um, you know. But there are enough people who are that even within that cohort, <laughs> it's still there's still a lot of people there, right? So, I mean, what do we do well? I mean, I think we we we've, we've always done a good job of uh, making quality product very consistently. Um, which I know historically has been one of the knocks against craft beer that, that, that sometimes it's it's being uh, a little bit inconsistent from from batch to batch or, or that just kind of basic elements of product quality haven't always haven't always been there and that's something that I know in the past kind of in previous waves of craft beer development had actually turned consumers a- against craft beer uh, and back to some of the major brands because they, they just wanted something that was a bit more kind of predictable yeah. essentially and reliable. Um, so, so we've always tried, you know, we've always tried to focus on that, uh, you know, over the past few years, um, and, you know, particularly with our brew pubs coming online, which has given us the ability to do some, some really cool experimentation with the new products. I think we've, um, moved ourselves a, a, a bit more to, uh, the forefront in terms of what's going on with, uh, with trends within, within beer styles, uh, for craft beer. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to make sure that we're, we're addressing, uh, kind of what's, um, uh, you know, what's coming next, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of what people are looking for from a, from a craft brewer, yeah. um, you know, and, and then, you know, then, then I think there's, um, you know, th- there's the element of just, you know, trying our best to do a good job of, of, of servicing our, our core local market. Uh, which, as I, as I said before, you know, is people who live here, but also all of the people who come and, and visit here. So between, uh, you know, the, the location in, you know, original location in Baysville, you know, the two locations now in Huntsville and, and, and Bracebridge, uh, and but even just, you know, being out in the community uh, and, um, you know, whether it's whether it's events or supporting charitable causes or, or things like that, just really, you know, trying to make sure that we're, we're out there um, and uh, and trying to connect with the people who, who we ultimately depend on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, um, but you know, if I if I had if I had the answer as to as to how to you know really <laughs> you know solidly unassailably differentiate yourself within the craft beer space, uh, I I probably wouldn't be sitting here. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. fair enough. That would um, probably be like the keys to the kingdom, I guess. But you know, I think also yeah. like what makes you unique is things probably like your people. Like when I walk into the brewery in Baysville, like the staff are asking me if I want samples and like, it's the entertainment on your patio. And it's maybe things that like, you don't even see as the founder, but like your customers see it and they feel it. Like maybe it's the energy behind the whole operation. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I I guess, um, I guess they say that culture is something that that's that is difficult to see from the inside, right? It's kind of just. Oh yeah. Uh, but I mean, I I mean, I like to think that we that we are a, a welcoming uh, business, um, both in terms of uh, you know in terms of our people, but 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 definitely also for our customers, and, and uh, mm-hmm. um, you know that that uh, we really do try to to make sure that. Uh, that people feel uh, like we're, you know, we're, we're happy to, <laughs> we're happy to have them joining us. We, we really want them to have a good experience uh, when they, when they, both when they come and see us at our physical outlets, but also when they're, when they're drinking their beer at home. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I really like about uh, craft beer culture and particularly, you know, the, from, from the early stages of, of, of the business is um, it, it has always been a welcoming sort of industry, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and you know, one where people kind of didn't tend to put on airs 
Um, uh, you know, it, it's tended to be a pretty down to earth um, sort of place to be. And that, that's changing a, a, a little bit now. Um, but, you know, I think that's something that, that our industry should really, really try not to lose. There's always the temptation to kind of veer off into, you know, snobbery <laughs> or, uh, um, or, you know, telling people what style of beer they, they ought to enjoy or, or things like that. But, uh, you know, ultimately we, we are here to, uh, we're here to make people happy. <laughs> that's, uh, we, we briefly sold beer. Uh, down in the U.S. for for a couple of years, and uh, and and that was one. I remember one of the uh, distributors we dealt with down there basically said, "Yeah, we're in the we're in the happy business." Yeah, <laughs> you think beer. you're in and, the beer business, but you're actually in the happy business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I love so, that. Uh, yeah. So curious. Uh, you've had a lot of growth and launched these new projects. So in 2018, you launched your first ever restaurant and that was the Huntsville brew house. And mm. most recently you also launched the brace bridge barrel house. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. so what was the vision behind adding this pillar to your distribution? Like you're getting now into the restaurant business, I guess. So take us back to why you decided to launch those projects. Well, basically just felt that the brewing industry wasn't chaotic and risky enough already. So we should get into restaurants <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> love it yeah. end of answer <laughs> the, 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 the two just cancel one another out if you're already in one risky business and you just layer another one on top of it then <laughs> then I it just that. makes everything better so, okay i'm yeah, gonna apply yeah. that strategy to my life now <laughs> <laughs> um so no it, it's I guess it comes back to what i was saying before about how everybody has to uh has to do a really good job of making and distributing beer and also one or two other things as well. Um, so, you know, and, and so we decided that getting into the brew pub business was one of the other things that, that we were going to do. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of, uh, there's all sorts of reasons to, to like it. I mean, it's a, it's a, a great, um, venue to uh to get people to introduce people to our brand or to or to maintain connection uh, uh with the brand um it's uh, it's fun for for the customer to come in and, and feel like they've got you know they've almost got like a front row seat to uh to our product development where they, they get to be the first to try you know new and exciting things that are um you know that are being developed there um you know but then uh getting into it, you know, we realized as well that, that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole, uh, you know, there's a whole dimension, uh, to it on the, you know, on the food side as well, that, uh, you know, obviously we came at it from, from the, you know, from the angle of being a, a brewery and thinking about the beer, but, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, the food aspect of, of the, the brew pub operations has, um, has really blossomed, um, and, and become, a part that's actually just as important uh, to us now as as the uh, as the beer offering, mm -hmm. um, and and you start to see all of the different really neat ways that that those two things can can go together. Um, and in fact, I mean, we we see you know we see lots of people coming into the the brew pubs who may not may not even drink beer. You know, they come in for the food and a glass of wine or something like that, and that's fine. Um, you know, we just we're happy to have them there, just enjoying some time with us. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, so obviously we, we got, got going with the location in Huntsville. We were, we were really happy with how that was going. Um, got into constructing the location in Bracebridge. Um, everything seemed like it was going great. And then, and then uh, the pandemic hit. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we had to finish constructing it kind of in the middle of all that. So it was, it was a bit late getting open. Uh, we did get it open last, last August. Um, to the extent that we've been able to have people inside the restaurant, we've been really pleased with it and people seem to have been really happy with it. So I, I think, you know, at this point, we're just kind of counting down the days until we can get people back inside there again. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate all the support we've gotten in terms of takeout business and things like that. But I think both for the customer and for us, we really, you know, we want people in the restaurant. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's, uh, um, that's where we think we can deliver the best experience for people. Um, and uh, so yeah, looking, uh, looking forward to being able to start doing, uh, doing that again.
So that's so cool. I mean, that is very just inspirational that you've launched, you know, not only one brew house in Huntsville, but now you're on to the second one. And I believe these mm-hmm. spaces are going to gather people in the best possible way post pandemic. Mm-hmm. Cause I think we're craving that connection. We're craving just the experience of having good food on the table with friends, with good cocktails, drinks, beers, all that stuff. So I can imagine mm-hmm. that you will see a nice spike and people will be so ready for the experience that you guys deliver through the barrel house and through the brew house. So very excited for you. And do you anticipate launching more or are you kind of like, okay, let's let these couple restaurants run their course first, or do you have other big projects in the works? I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. (laughs) (laughs) We got a couple other things we're looking at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's kind of your job as the founder is to always be dreaming, right? Like literally Mm -hmm. you have to be thinking what's next and like, Mm -hmm. why stop here? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you've got something that feels like it's working and and you see other opportunities to kind of, to kind of keep going with it, then, then why not? Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so yeah, we're, we're looking at a a couple other, couple other opportunities for next steps there. So, Mm -hmm. uh, So of course, like Lake of Bays is so much bigger than just you these days. So how big is your team right now? And like, walk us through, like, what was it like to grow a company beyond yourself? Um, Yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably been one of the, one of the most rewarding and also one of the most challenging parts of it. I mean, so when we first opened, it was, it was me and four people. Yeah. Um, And now we've got team of about 50 but I mean once the restaurants get back up and running again properly it's going to be close to 100 wow. um, when, uh, when you kind of put it all together so I mean that's uh, you know that's definitely being a, a change where you know I, I know for myself I feel bad sometimes where you know I uh, I don't always get the chance to to even you know to, to meet some people when they when they started the company they've been you know they've been working here for a month or something like that and then yeah. it's like oh my goodness uh, hello <laughs> you know like yeah I, I, i've seen your name i've never actually met you i'm sorry you know like it, it's uh um it, it's yeah it's definitely um it, it's definitely true that that the, the the dynamic changes as you end up with more people inside an organization and yeah. uh, um you know yeah like i i i feel like we're we're uh we're getting to a, a good place um, in terms of our, in terms of our team, that there's, there's a, and even just kind of, you know, where we're at as an organization, you know, I think there's kind of this awkward teenage phase that a lot of companies go through where, you know, you're, you're, you're big enough to start needing to, to, to do some of the things that, that bigger companies do, you know, like you, you, you start to have that, you know, the need for somebody to cover off HR functions and the need for, you know, good, good people in charge of kind of all of the, you know, major verticals within the business and, and everything like that, but you don't always necessarily have um, have the budget or or even just the, the the team assembled or or the the just experience as an organization to to have everything kind of put together yet. And and so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I know I know for myself personally, it, you know, it it can feel a lot of the time like. It, or it has felt, you know, a lot of the time over the years, like, uh, you know, a situation of, of trying to put systems in place and just kind of, the second you look away, something is blowing up and, and you know, that you, that you thought you had kind of <laughs> put someplace and it's now, you know, blowing up and flying back in your face and you, and you need to catch it and, and, and deal with it again. So it can, it can turn into uh, just what feels like a lot of just like running on a treadmill to, to try and keep things just working properly. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, I feel like we've, we've really made, you know, we've made some progress on that in terms of just getting, getting uh, a lot of good people in place over the course of the, the past few years, as well as making sure that we held on to, uh, you know, good people who we've had since the beginning mm-hmm. um, to, you know, to get to a point where we've, we've got a team that's, that I think is really starting to gel, which is, uh, which is really nice to see. Mm. So with so much to manage, like, how do you find balance as kind of the, the captain of the ship? Cause obviously you need to take yourself out of the day-to-day operations, but I don't know if that comes naturally to you. So just like, how are you finding balance as the leader of this very big company? 
or just, you know, kind of closing my eyes and plugging my ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like ignore, don't call me. My phone's off. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> Somehow I don't believe that. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no. I mean, it, it's. It, I mean, it is a challenge. Uh, uh, particularly, you know, having uh, you know having kids now as well, where uh, you know, uh, you know, and I think that that is something I've, I've become more aware of, even just over the course of the, the past year and a bit, spending a lot more time at home. Is is just yeah, you know, you. you uh, you see the things that that you're you know that you're missing in uh, or that you can miss in your personal life by just you know spending your your whole life kind of focused on on work and yeah. and you know I, I I'd like to think that I've I've always managed to do a, a pretty good job of you know not being one of those entrepreneurs who is literally just working like 80 hours a week like yeah. I, I I'm I can recognize in myself when I need when I need to stop because I'm not actually getting anything more done. I'm just kind of like yep. trying to work, but I'm too tired and I'm just getting making myself frustrated and yes. I just need to stop and walk away and come back to it. Like, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I think that the, the challenge is, you know, walking away and still and, and then kind of being present in whatever else it is that you're trying to do you know whether it's spending time with your with your family or going and doing another activity or something like that it's yeah. like it can be really hard to not still be kind of at work even when you're not at work mm -hmm. um and so i you know i i don't i don't know that that there's any magic answer to that but apart from just spending spending more time you know running a business and getting used to the pressures of it. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I know that I can look back at things that used to really stress me out or drive me crazy earlier in, in, in our development as, as a business that just like do not bother me one bit anymore. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then of course there's new things <laughs> to, to drive you crazy, but, you know, I, I, I think you get to a point where you, you've, you've seen enough and, and, and been through enough that um, you start to gain some ability to, to, or some confidence that, you know, yeah, there's, there's always stuff flying around and coming out of nowhere and, 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 and things like that. But, you know, even if you, you don't exactly know what the solution is going to be today, you, you have a degree of confidence that you're going to be able to figure out a solution um, mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, you can sleep at night. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I think, you know, needing to kind of see that there's a, you know, that, that there's a, a pathway out of a, or a solution to every single problem that's in front of you today is just a recipe for, for insanity. Um, mm -hmm. When, uh, uh, you know, when you're, when you're running a business like this, there's just, you know, there's just inherently so much uncertainty um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so much going on that you get, I think it, and, and I, I know like I, I'm, I'm a bit of a detail freak and, and a bit of a perfectionist. And so I think, you know, that's, that's probably one of the things that I've had to work on the most uh, just on a personal level is, is being able to accept that, you know, there's going to be some messiness yeah. as, as we go along and we'll clean it up and keep making things better, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. not to, not to go crazy over it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and it's interesting yeah. because you say that uh, on your website, your philosophy is make great beer, run a down to earth business and have some fun while you're at it. And it sounds mm -hmm. like, you know, that is what you are striving for with not working 24 seven and shutting down when you're hitting a wall. Like to me, that is down to earth. It's knowing that you are not superhuman. You can't just work 24 seven and hustle all of the time and expect to solve every problem instantly because this is life. Like, you know, we're living among many other factors and life is too complex to just be so perfect as an entrepreneur and to just know everything and to work your way through every single problem. So I just think that, yeah, perfectly reflects on your business's philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, and I, yeah, I think if somebody tells you, uh, tells you that they have all the answers or thinks they have all the answers, they're either, they're either deluding themselves or lying. So <laughs> yeah, they're definitely, yeah. One of the two. So I can appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> um, obviously there are many things that you need to learn as the leader of this company and always be kind of growing your own mindset and that. So I'm curious, is there anything that you're trying to learn or a skill that you're upgrading right now in order to become better? 
Um, in ter- yeah, in terms of the, the business itself, mm-hmm. you know, honestly, right now, <laughs> I, I feel like I am just kind of holding on <laughs> with, with a bit of a white knuckle grip. And, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I, I think, um, and, and there's a combination of things. I mean, obviously, the, you know, dealing with the pandemic, there's there's been just a, a, a continuous need to, you know, tear, tear apart plans, rebuild them. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. This, speaking to your um, point, just holding on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I wish I got a cookie. <laughs> Soon. Um, oh, okay. Oh, here we go. It's actually going to help me out. All right. So we got a, we got a guess. This is my son, uh, Thomas's solution. When, when he thinks daddy's been working too much, he starts to bring me toys that can, that can do the work for me so that I, I don't have to be on the computer anymore. So, I love it. So See, we, this we, is we down to earth. Digger. Yeah. We have Dexter Digger and we also have uh, Flip and Tip Fred, the, uh, the garbage truck. So they're, they're <laughs> oh my gosh. Perfectly, <laughs> perfectly explains your point of just needing to hold on. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So no, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that I have like a, like a one good answer to that question, except yeah. that I, I think, um, I mean, obviously it's been, it's been a trying, you know, 16 months or so, uh, you know, both on the business side, but, but then even personally, you know, trying to juggle schooling from yeah. home and everything like that, particularly over the course, course of the past couple of months when, uh, you know, all the, um, uh, you know, all the kids have obviously, uh, obviously being home and um yep uh, we uh, i guess we had uh, uh we had a little girl just at the beginning of the pandemic so luckily my, my wife was off on that leave for for 12 months which made it a little bit easier to try and juggle things at home and then she went back to work and so then it's really <laughs> a juggling yeah. act over the course of the past couple of months so you know i, I think it, it's now i think what's been what's been good coming out of that though is it, i think i um I, it, it's kind of being a forced exercise and learning not to sweat the small stuff <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, a little bit, you know, and uh, and just by by necessity, you 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 have to focus on you know the things that are critical to get done in order to get through each day, and uh, and also uh, you know I think a, a bit of an illustration of of uh, you know need the, of needing to kind of just take things day by day, uh, a yeah. bit, you know both both in 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 a business and, and personal sense because uh, mm-hmm. you know we've we've, uh, we've gotten burned a couple of times during the pandemic, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, make changes within our business or, I mean, that word pivot has been, you know, overused to, <laughs> to an incredible degree during the pandemic. But I mean, you know, we, we've gotten hit with it a couple of times where you, you, you try to pivot to, you know, to do something new during the pandemic and then they change the rules yep. and you've just spent a bunch of money and time and effort trying to, um, you know, trying to make something happen within your business in response to, to, what the circumstances were and then you know it's uh so it, we've uh yeah i mean i think it's you know sometimes you you actually um you know the 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 more the more you kind of flail around the yeah uh, the, the worst thing yeah i don't know that i'm expressing this necessarily all that well but uh no um, but I, I think you've kind of nailed it like you almost just have mm-hmm. to sit back and like you know give yourself some grace and not try to make any like irrational pivots because we don't mm-hmm. know so you know it, it's yeah. just the state yeah. of the world at this point yeah i mean and it's it's tough because you know i, I guess yeah and when, when you're in business you, you tend to always want to do things yeah. You know, okay, if something has happened, well, then we need to, we need to act, we need to do something in response to this. And, 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 you know, at, at various points throughout the pandemic, it actually doing something has yeah. turned out to be worse than not doing anything <laughs> and, and just accepting that this is how things are going to be for the next little while. Yeah. Um, I so. think though, that the entrepreneurial mindset, like it doesn't shut off. Like you can try to turn it down, but like your nature is like, solve the problem. Let's go like be resourceful, figure it out. And it's hard to mute that because that's just baked into, I think the entrepreneurial DNA. So yeah, it's definitely yeah, I mean, fascinating. And normally that is the right way to do things. <laughs> you know, so it's Yeah. In it, normal it, it times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, yeah. What's the, I've heard, heard a couple of psychologists during the pandemic talk about this little, phrase uh this term learned helplessness you know and it, and it feels a bit like that of just like having to train yourself to and, and maybe that's not exactly what it refers to but but you know 
feels like an app description for having to train yourself to just kind of sit here and go, well, we're closed for another two months and that's that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Learn yeah. helplessness. Yeah. Sit back yeah. and enjoy it, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so in wrapping this up, being that this is a spotlight on the town of Bracebridge, I'm curious, uh, why is it that you love the town of Bracebridge? Why did you decide to open the barrel house there? Well, it, it, it just seemed like a natural fit. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, obviously one of the bigger communities within Muskoka. Geographically, it's kind of central within uh, within the region. Uh, I mean, the, the town itself is, you know, is really great. It's got the, the historic downtown section, but then it's also got, you know, a really busy kind of commercial center um, uh, a little bit away from there. That's actually where we ended up locating the barrel house. But um, uh, I mean, you've got the, you know, the setting with the river coming right through town, it, you know, it, it accesses directly out onto, onto Lake Muskoka. You've got, you know, a combination of uh, a solid year round population base with obviously a, a lot of, of seasonal uh, traffic coming through as well. So it's just, um, and the, um, you know, we, we saw that there was, there was an opportunity to, to put a group up here that, uh, you know, obviously there's other breweries in town, but nobody seemed to be doing kind of exactly that. Mm -hmm. So, um, we thought we would, uh, we would go for it. So, um, we, yeah, yeah. Love it. So there are a lot of listeners of the podcast who aspire to start a business. Many of them live in smaller towns. So wondering, do you have any advice for someone looking to start or grow a business in a smaller town based on your own experience? For sure. I mean, I, I think, um, pro yeah, probably the biggest single piece of advice would be, you know, don't, um, don't discount uh, you know, business opportunities in, in smaller communities. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, I mean, and, and yes, you know, you, you've always got to have enough consumers within, you know, within whatever your catchment area is to be able to sustain your business. You still got to, you still got to make sure you understand things like that. But, um, you know, there, there can be this tendency uh, to think that, you know, all the big business opportunities only occur in, in you know, major cities or, or larger, larger urban centers. And it's like, mm, you know, thinking even just to, of the example of, uh, you know, of our business, you know, if you can be, you know, the only brew pub or one of just a handful of breweries in a smaller community, mm -hmm. that can be just as good or better than being one of hundreds in a big city. Um, so, um, you know, that there's uh, just, just because you're located in a smaller community doesn't mean that your business will be, you know, condemned to being, you know, smaller than, than it could be if, if you were located someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, sometimes in, in smaller communities, there are these opportunities that come up where there's, there's just some really obvious niche that you can see being successfully um, kind of filled someplace else yeah. that just isn't being done in your community yet. And you've got the opportunity to be first in, you know, and, and those types of, of opportunities tend not to exist in larger centers, but they really can in smaller communities. And, you know, if you can be the first person doing it, then that, that can actually put you in a, in a really strong position to have a, a solid, sustainable business. Um, so, you know, yeah, I guess it would be just don't, uh, don't count yourself out um, would be my advice. Awesome. So if somebody is listening to this podcast and now they're craving beer, they're craving a visit to the restaurants or the brew house or the barrel house, uh, where are all of the places they can find you and how should they stay connected to you guys? Uh, for sure. Yeah. So, so we are, so our beer is available at, across Ontario uh, through the LCDO, the beer store, uh, most uh, licensed grocery stores uh, and, and in bars and restaurants across the whole province. Uh, you can find our beer through our online store as well at lakeofbeesbrewing.ca and uh, we will uh, we will ship anywhere in the province and it typically gets there within a couple of days. Wow. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, Very cool. And uh, yeah, free shipping on orders over $75. So if you order a case in a bit, then we'll, we'll ship it to you for free as well. So, um, and then in terms of, uh, in terms of actually coming to visit us directly. So we've got the, the original brewery, our main brewery in Baysville. Uh, we've got the Huntsville Brew House. Um, a brew pub, a 105 seat establishment up there. We've got the, uh, the Bracebridge Barrel House. 
um, where we do our barrel aging program. That's a, about 140 seat uh, establishment there. Um, just this summer, we're opening, like I mentioned earlier, the beer garden at Live Outside in Bracebridge, so right down by the water at, uh, at the Live Outside, which is an outdoor adventure store. Um, and uh, I think that's about it for now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that oh, gives us a lot. Farmers markets. So we're doing, yeah, we're doing farmer's markets this year as well. They're just, uh, uh, they've, they've just opened that up to breweries. So uh, we are at the Bracebridge Farmer's Market every Saturday, uh, and we're also going to be at the Fort Carling Farmer's Market, I believe, every Thursday uh, in July and August. Oh, how cool is that? I love that you're doing the, the, I want to say like the, not old school, but like, just, yeah, like such a fun experience to be at a farmer's market, like connecting with people one-on-one outdoor in a more casual setting. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really neat. I mean, we've we've literally done one of them (laughs) thus far as the the Bracebridge farmer's market last weekend. It went really well. So, so excited to see what can happen this summer. But I mean, um, cideries and I believe some wineries have been doing it for some time. So yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Opened up the beer. So yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a really exciting move. Oh, I know the, the word I was looking for was grassroots. It's a very grassroots yeah. way to connect with people, but yeah. like the brands yeah. that I buy at farmer's markets, I become like a raving fan. Cause I'm always there talking with the person behind the counter. And I don't know, it's just a, a great experience and it always keeps me coming back for more. So very yeah. cool. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Darren, thank you so much for sharing your story and for taking us behind the scenes of how Lake of Bays Brewery started. And we can't wait to sip one of your awesome beers. My husband and I are big fans of the off the grid. So uh, that appears regularly in our fridge and there will probably be some cooling tonight. So thank you again. And we wish you all of the best.